Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Today is the day. Tonight at our family meeting at 5 o'clock, we'll have our big announcement that uh, we've been waiting for. We've got so, some other important items to cover in that family uh, meeting as well. And, uh, but uh, this will be when we present to you the news of what's going to be happening uh, for the church. And I will tell you that this, uh, as Richard pointed out last week, this is one of the most important meetings that we'll have. Uh, it, a lot of the future of this church is going to be determined by how you respond to this new news. So we want everybody here uh, have at least one family member here from each of our families. I think we have 70 families. So hopefully we'd have at least 70 people here and maybe more if we get both, both of them coming in. But anyway, don't, don't forget to do that and also bring some finger foods and uh, I appreciate that. Kay uh, Green brought me some of my favorite finger food this week. Uh, that was very nice of her to do that. It's all gone, Kay, I tell you. <laughs> I can't bring it and share it. It's a finger food thing tonight. All right, we're continuing in our lessons on the story this week from Acts, the book of Acts, the church begins. As our story began this week, Jesus is making his final meeting with the disciples, the apostles, on the Mount of Olives. And it's here that he gives the marching orders. He says, I want you to remain in Jerusalem and wait on the power of the Holy Spirit to fall on you. And after that, you're going to be witnesses for me in uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And then Jesus ascends into heaven with the promise that he'll return in like manner. So the disciples did as Jesus asked. They stayed in Jerusalem and while they're in the upper room during the feast of Pentecost, Pente meaning 50, 50 days after the Passover, important feast in the, in the Jewish uh, theology. And so there's going to be probably millions of people right there in Jerusalem during this time. And so while they're in this room, the Holy Spirit comes upon them as promised, and they emerge then into the streets that are teeming with people and begin to tell a new message. And Peter, taking the lead along with the other apostles, is to begin to preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that people can be saved only through Him. And he says all that they'll have to do is believe, repent, and be baptized, and they'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Their sins will be forgiven, and they will then escape the punishment that is due all sinners. And so by the time Peter stops talking, 3,000 people respond to his message, and the Bible says they were added to their number. So the bride of Christ, the church, begins on Pentecost Day in approximately 33 A.D. Historians tell us that this was not some 3,000 mega church, uh, but it was a lot of little churches. They met in homes throughout Jerusalem, probably about 30 in each group. And so there were about 100 homes where they were worshiping together throughout honeycomb throughout Jerusalem. Now our text for today that uh, Chip read just a moment ago tells us that they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine and they devoted themselves to one another. They devoted themselves to a study of the scriptures. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They were a family. They prayed together. They studied the word together. They took care of their neighbors. They even sold possessions when they had to to take care of other believers that were from other nations. And so this was an exciting time. And people saw that and they thought, I want to be a part of that. Here we see a body of believers who are excited. The power is being exhibited in that church and they wanted to be a part of it. 
And so what it means is that our responsibility today is that we continue this excitement, uh, continue uh, this powerful life so that the world will know what the church of Jesus Christ is all about. And that's what I want us to talk about today is what is the church. And this is just a, a basic doctrinal lesson for you today, but I think it's one that we probably don't talk too much about. But here in our lesson for this week, we see the beginning of the church. What did God had in mind? We need to know to what we are supposed to be committed. Now, it is true that the church today, it's, it's either admired or it's criticized. But you know, you can admire a church without belonging to it. And you can criticize a church without ever leaving it. But I think both the admiration and the criticism sometimes is directed toward a facade, toward a concept of what the church is and not toward the genuine, genuine article. A man's shadow is real, but it's not the man. And so sometimes we either admire or criticize a shadow of what the church really is all about. And so we need to focus on the real church. I, what I'm saying is that most people don't really have a concept of what the church is all about. And, and so that's what I want us to talk about today. I want us to investigate what is this church that Jesus died for, that he built, he paid for with his own blood. What is this church all about? And first of all, I would submit to you that the church is the body of Christ. Now, turn in your Bibles. We're going to be reading together today. Ephesians chapter 1, and I want us to read verses 17 through 23. <clears throat> I'll give you just a moment to get there. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 17, says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over every, uh, everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so I submit, first of all, if the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that the church is one body. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Paul talked about that. He said there is one body, one spirit, one hope. He was talking about the unity uh, of believers there. We've already read here in in, in uh, Ephesians, where he said that, that he's head over the church. That indicate, didn't say the churches. He said the church, which is his body. So the church is the body. In Colossians 1 and 18, he said he's head of the body, which is the church. In Ephesians, he said he's head over the church, which is the body. So the body is the church, and church is the body. I remember when I first started preaching, I was... Uh, in a church in Birmingham, Alabama, and I was talking about the one church and, and the one body. And I said, so if the church is the body and the body is the church, how many churches are there? And one little boy said, one. And I said, well, thank goodness somebody got it. You know, <laughs> that's the kind of responses I like, by the way. Go ahead and if I ask you how many churches are there, what, what are you going to say? One. There you go. One. There is one body. Christ died for the church, and, and so he, he's only one head, so he must only have one body. Now, the whole church is also 
the body of Christ. The, the whole church, the entire church, anyone who has reached the age of accountability is ready to answer to God for the sin in his life. He is either in the body or he's not. One or the other. And of course, if he has qualified himself to be in that body, then he, then he or she is in. But the church is and always has been and always will be the entire people. The whole ecclesia, uh, the, the assembly, the gathering, the called out. Uh, God has called us out of the world into the body of his dear son. And so the complete fellowship of the faithful is the body of Christ. All Christians belong to that chosen nation, the royal priesthood that Peter talked about in 1 Peter chapter 2. And all members are equal in this body. Uh, Paul reflected on that in, in Galatians 3 when he said, There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free. We are uh, male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you this, friends. Christ is present in his church. Yes, even today. He's head of the church, and so he does not exist on earth without his body, the church. And the church doesn't exist without its head, Jesus Christ. Christ gave himself for the church. He purchased the church with his own blood, and he continues to give himself to the church even today. Turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. You see, Jesus is active now. He is continuing to intercede for us. He is continuing to care, to nurture, and to take care of his body. And, and so he, he not only gave himself for it one time, he's giving himself to it all the time, now and forever. And so the problem is we can believe the truth about the church, but then we don't trust the people who are made up in the church, right? But we, have to, we just have to understand that, friend, we are the church. We are stuck with one another. With, even with all of our little quirks and quips and, you know, all the things that, that we have as, as human beings, we are the church. And surely we believe that God has added us to that church. It's what he said in, in Acts, that 3,000 were added to their number. And then in verse 47 it says, as with people were being saved, they were added to uh, to the church. So Christ built his church, he bought his church, and he adds people to the church. Only he can add or subtract people from his body. He's the one that's in, in charge. In uh, Matthew chapter 16, he asked the, the apostles uh, first, who do men say I am? Then he said, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, on this rock I will build my church. So it's his church. Therefore, because it's his church, we should be praising the church. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Paul gloried in the church. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely, am I? Oh, I'm in chapter 4. No wonder it didn't sound right. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and forever. So the, the church is the body of Christ. But then number two, the church is idealistic and yet historical. There is an ideal church, an ultimate church. It's, it's the goal and destiny 
for all of us in the church. And that's what Paul described in Ephesians chapter 5 when he said Christ is going to present his bride pure, holy, blameless, without spot and wrinkle. He's going to present that ideal church to God at judgment time. And so there is an ideal church. The Bible says the manifold wisdom of God made the church known to us. The Bible says the church is blood bought, Holy Spirit filled, and heaven bound. And the reason that's true is because the church belongs to Jesus and not to men. However, just because it's not just an institution, it's God's institution. But just because it's God's institution doesn't mean that there's not a problem here. Because the problem is the church of God is divine and it's right, but it's also historical and human. A lot of people criticize the church for not living up to the ideal, for not living up to the claim. I'll tell you, friends, no church ever has and no church ever will. That's the ideal that we strive for, but we'll never be the ideal church until Christ presents us to God after judgment. We need to realize that, that any failings in God's church is not with God. It's with man in the church. Even a church decreed by God has to be in, inhabited by mankind. Men and women, boys and girls. And so I'm just, I'm just trying to point out that we live and we exist in a historical church and it's full of us human beings. And so we, although we strive for that ideal, we are historical. But number three, the church is visible, but it's invisible. And I think the concepts of visible and invisible with, that, with regard to the church has been misunderstood by many because any church composed of mankind is not invisible, is it? It's visible. I mean, we, we can see one another. The church is not God. It's not Christ. It's not angels. The church is us. And we're visible. Without us, there's no church. Right? And, and so the, the church is visible, but it's also invisible. As the body of Christ in the whole sense we can't really see that. We can't really even comprehend it, I don't think. The whole body of Christ, the universal church. It's hard for us to, to even think about what that means. But we'll have to agree that there's more to the church than just the sum total of its members. There has to be more to it that we can see, more than appears on the surface. And it is true, even though we are a group of human beings, we are God's chosen human beings. Perhaps we could say it this way. The visible church consists of all the members on earth, the ones before, and us, from a lower story perspective. That's the visible church. But the invisible church then is the whole church as seen by God, saved and coming to be with Him. From an upper story perspective, it's the invisible church to us. Only God can see it and only God can direct it. And so the local church, uh, the church is local and yet it's also universal. Christ died for the church. He didn't die for a denomination. He didn't even die for one single local congregation. The local congregation is not the total ecclesia or church. The church is visible only by local congregations. And each local body is autonomous and complete. And, and we just need to understand that the local church does not belong to the universal church. It is the church. Okay? We're not just a part of something else. We are the church. And so the local church is the entire church, but it is not the entire church. Is that confusing? <laughs> Thank you for that. 
it, it could be confusing if, if you understand. It is a church. It's, an enti- it's the entire church that we can see, that we can participate in, that we can be a part of it, but it's not the entire church that God sees that God knows about, that God ministers to uh, on a regular basis. Everything that can be offered by the universal church is offered by the local congregation. And so the New Testament talks about it in in those two senses as the whole church and it talks about it as a local church. As a matter of fact, every directive given to the church has been given to a local congregation with the idea that that precept would be passed on to all the congregations and thereby would be a command to the universal church. And and that's where we get what God wants for us is in the scripture. When uh, When he through his writers tells the church what he wants to see from them and what he expects from them, then that's the directive to the universal church even though it was written originally to one local congregation. But then finally, the church is holy and yet sinful. We're the called out ones. We're the separated from the earth. We live in this world, but we don't belong here. As we sang, we are poor wayfaring strangers wandering through this land of woe. And then we sang... This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. The Bible talks about that our citizenship, the body of Christ, the citizenship is in heaven. And because God forgives and blesses his people, then they are sanctified, they are holy, and they are set apart. But also, the church is composed of weak, erring, sinful people. And this is the contradiction, isn't it? We're sanctified, we're holy, and we're set apart by the work of Christ. And yet, we're human beings, and therefore we're erring, weak, erring, and sinful. And so you see how then that the church is holy, and yet sinful, and it's sinful, and yet holy. We're justified and kept by faith in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, not by perfection, and that's what Jesus was teaching in the parable of the tares. He said the, we, the weeds are going to grow in there with, with the good seed. He also t- taught the parable of the net. He said there's some good fish and the bad fish. And so God is going to do the separating at judgment day, right? But you see some of my brethren, they want to do the separating now. You know, they don't want to worship with hypocrites. They don't want to worship with someone who, who, who may disagree with them. They don't want to worship with someone who, who might be sinful and soiled and stained. And sometimes you can tell that by looking at them when they walk in the door. You may not want them. But friends, I believe the church is just for that. Because the church is sinful And people come to the church then to be healed, to become holy. I believe that the church is a hospital for sinners, not a luxury hotel for saints. We come to Jesus to grow in our holiness, to become holy. We don't come because we're already holy. That was the problem the Pharisees had. They thought they were already holy. So, God's church on earth, speaking of the human element, will always be soiled and sinful. But you see, that speaks to the greatness of God's grace. It speaks to the abundant mercy that he bestows upon us through Jesus Christ. You know what I think, too? I think the world is crying today for the church. The Protestant denominations don't know the message, nor they do, do they know the church. Roman Catholicism is falling apart at the seams. But we, undenominational Christianity, we stand with both. We stand with God's message, and we stand for the church. I think the greatest theological movements in the history of mankind was the dis- rediscovery of the Bible 
and the rediscovery of God's church, His ideal church. But we can never be the church that you read about in the Bible until we teach what they taught and practice what they preached. And I want to tell you something, friends, on a personal note. This church means more to me than I do to myself. I have given my heart and my life and my means to this church. Her loves are my loves. Her truths are my truths. Her mind is my mind. And I'll tell you why. Because this church is the body of Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer, my intercessor, my Master. I love Him, therefore I love His body. And friends, He stands now waiting on you. He's opened up His arms. You know, the church is the only thing Jesus ever promised to save. And He's opening His arms up now. And He's saying, I want you to, to come back in to the arms of Jesus into the body. Our plea of going back to the Bible, restoring New Testament Christianity to the 21st century is the most reasonable, the most rational, the most logical plea in theology today. We've got the message. We've got the church. And we need to proclaim both. And today we're asking you, will you come and be a part of the body of Jesus Christ the righteous? If you will, come while we stand and sing together. I keep Jesus waiting, waiting.